Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are just giving it a few more minutes here. We're right at 1230, letting people log on. Um, I am Amy Clickner, the CEO of the Lake Superior Community Partnership, and we welcome you to our very first Partner Perspectives with our good friend, Stephanie Jones. So we'll just give it a minute here. Hi, Stephanie. Good morning, afternoon. All right. Uh, I'm just going to give a little few housekeeping things here. Uh, first of all, Partner Perspectives introduces the community to our LSCP board members, giving them the opportunity to hear an update on what's going on in their profession, how the current crisis has affected them, and anything LSCP that comes up. We'll take a few minutes um, for me to introduce here, but I also want to go over some housekeeping. Uh, I'd like to go over a few items, um, and you're listening in your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have an opportunity to submit questions by typing them in the questions panel of the control. Of the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Jones, Associate Broker, MAR Approved Educator. Stephanie has had many years of sales experience. She is active in many aspects of real estate from the UP Realtors Board President multiple times and the National Association of Realtors Federal Political Coordinator for Michigan's District 1. She also teaches a number of real estate classes. Stephanie is also active in the Marquette community, serving on the Lake Superior Community Partnership Board, and she's also an officer of our organization and the Marquette Economic Club Board as well. In addition, Stephanie has chaired fundraisers for many organizations, including the UP Children's Museum, UPAS, the Market Women's Center, just to name a few. So never a dull moment um, <laughs> for Stephanie. She's always busy. Um, she's also a member of the Michigan Association of Realtors, the National Association of Realtors, and Upper Peninsula Realtors. So I think you can see a theme here. Um, <laughs> the work in real estate happens. Um, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us for this very first uh, Partners Perspectives. I really appreciate it. Well, I do think that we can say that the one thing we've gotten from this uh, pandemic is we have all gotten a little bit more creative. And I'm proud of LSCP for finding new ways to reach out to both our members and the public. And thank you for that, because, you know, I do think that we're seeing innovation and creativity amongst all types of organizations and businesses. And this is just one of those. You know, we talked, obviously, remotely as a team many times saying, OK, we miss business after hours and we miss some of the networking events that we have. We canceled our golf outing. I mean, these are things where business folks get together and just have a good time and and be able to connect and catch up. And it hasn't been as easy. So we wanted to come up with an idea of you know, how do we stay connected? And we have a few more um, tricks up our sleeve coming shortly, but we thought this is a great way to, you know, introduce our board members, talk a little bit about the different professions uh, that they're all in and how diversified our board is, as well as, you know, start talking a little bit about, you know, what have the last few months meant in your profession? Where do you see it going and those types of things? So I'm just gonna start with a few questions right out of the gate for you. I'm ready. Um, all right. Um, what has the real estate industry, how, how have you been impacted by COVID-19 and, you know, what are some of the innovative solutions we're seeing in your industry? Well, we started off with being told we weren't essential. And so uh, we were not allowed to, I the, think the wording was travel for anything real estate related, which meant we couldn't list homes, we couldn't show homes. And um, we were kind of frustrated for three months. Uh, we did also have to pivot as so many people are doing with conventions becoming virtual um, and, and Zoom meetings ad nauseum. Uh, but I think one of the things that we've come up with are some best practices and several of them I really hope carry on forever because I think they're good for the industry. Can you talk a little bit more about some of those you'd like to see stick as we move forward? 
Well, one of the things that I believe in and I advocate over and over is I don't think as an industry, I don't think we should be showing a home to someone that's not pre-approved. And right now, Michigan Realtors, that is part of their best practices in this time. And when you think about it from a seller's perspective, the less strangers you can have in your house, the better. And there is a long-standing feeling in real estate that my seller just wants showing. So they're happy anytime they can get a showing. And I truly believe that our sellers want showings for qualified buyers only. The last thing that family wants to do is get their three kids clean house out of the house, get the dogs out of the house, get the house beautiful and ready before they go to work at nine o'clock and then find out that the person who's looking at the house hasn't even bothered to go to the bank. I think that if more sellers knew how many people weren't qualified going through their homes, they'd be kind of upset with us. So as it's a best practice, that's been one of the things that across the board in Michigan, uh, agents have been, for the most part, uh, requiring their people to be pre-approved before they do a showing. It's also enabled us to kind of step up our picture game and do more video walkthroughs, Matterport tours, and things we can do to help people eliminate a house uh, instead of seeing 20 maybe they'll see 10. That's interesting because again you know so many of the creative and innovative solutions we're seeing are technologically related and so to be able to to look at homes and and know because you typically I would guess have a feel for what you're looking for um, and can mark so many off the list and again it eliminates you know marching through people's homes at a time when that's really not what we're trying to do. But you do bring up a good point. Um, you know, I'm guessing there's a lot of best practices for both the buyer and the seller, you know, and those are one of them, you know, as far as making sure you're pre-approved, making sure that your home looks good, um, making sure that you're checking out the virtual type of things. I mean, what other best practices can, can people employ when they're, when they're buying or selling a home? For sellers, one of the best practices is to have the all your lights on in your house, have cabinet doors open, uh, everything you can do to eliminate touch. And that makes your house show better. And I have always been a little frustrated when sellers say, please turn off lights when you leave. You know, you don't really want me spending my time looking at where that light switch is on the lamp that's actually on the wall. Uh, you want me spending my time talking to the buyers, seeing what their objections are, finding ways to potentially overcome those objections while we're in the house. And now as a best practice, uh, that's been something that sellers have seemed to embrace. And it is nice to go show a house when it's all lit up and ready. You can picture yourself living there um, instead of walking into a dark home that you have to fumble for light switches and what does this light switch go to? That's not what we should be worrying about on a showing. Exactly. One, one of the other things that's kind of interesting and it's gonna be fun to see uh, if this continues or not. Uh, I will say I'm not a fan of open houses and in our market, luckily open houses are not a driving force of um, sales. In some areas they are, and indefinitely in new construction they are. But again, it's getting people in your house who may not have any ability to pay for your house. So one of the things that agents have done once we were able to work before we were allowed to have open houses was they hosted open houses online and virtual open houses. And those were received really well, more so downstate where they have more of an open house culture, but uh, we are seeing open houses. We are able to do them again. Again, it requires all the COVID measures. We ask that people be masked. Um, agents are asked to wear gloves, either booties, uh, and no more than four people if you can help it on a showing. So we're, 
I don't think many realtors have ever been real excited about showing homes to uh, uh, parents and three, four kids running around. That's never been fun for us. <laughs> and in this day and age, it's a lot better to say, can you leave the kids at home? Can you find a sitter? In fact, one of the agents in my office had um, two parents and kids in the car. One parent went through the house, one stayed with kids in the car, the other parent went through. And it really allows the parents themselves the ability to actually see the house and not worry that Junior is crawling after a cat <laughs> under a couch or picking up, you know, a priceless something. Yes, I, I can only imagine. <laughs> And again, you know, we we talk about how how everybody has shifted and pivoted is the overused word. I, I, that I mean, I still use it, but I mean, we've pivoted. Oh, pivot and new normal. I don't care if I ever hear them again. Exactly. Yeah, coronavirus would be in there as well. <laughs> um, but when it was so so, we've gone through the last you know three three and a half months. It's been up and down. You know, what about your industry? What you know, have you come through kind of? um you know headed in the rebound direction had, had it hit the housing market much what are what does the market look like well it's really interesting because our market when we were shut down in march our market was pretty strong because we have low inventory so now when we reopened not only did we have low inventory but we had all the buyers we had in march plus the buyers that were coming into the market April, May, June. So it is not unusual now in many price ranges. Yesterday I was showing houses. Um, one new listing had 10 showings in two days. One had five the day it was listed. Um, so we're seeing a lot of activity. So I always think that you should be working with your agent before you list and before you buy to develop what your strategy is going to be. One of the things that some agents are employing with a house that they think is going to have high um, interest is they may list it on Thursday and review all offers on Monday, which is, I think, great for the consumer because it gives many buyers an opportunity to go through. Buyers can get so frustrated when they see a house come on the market, they're working the next day, they go to see it the day after that and it's already sold. Yeah. So when you, when you have that kind of delayed looking at offers, it really does create a level playing field. And it also keeps sellers from feeling overwhelmed. Sellers can get extraordinarily frustrated when they're, they list their house and the first offer they get is fantastic. So they accept it and they think they're great and good to go. And then all of a sudden they have people coming up to them at the grocery store saying, oh, my nephew wanted to look at your house and they were willing to pay more, but it was already sold. And that is just incredibly frustrating for sellers. So this is a good tool to allow them to, to be maintain control. And for buyers, one of the tools that agents are using in multiple bidding situations is what's called an acceleration clause. And an acceleration clause is where say the list price is 150,000 and the buyer comes in and they really want this house and they would go up to 160,000 but they don't want to offer 160,000 if there's no other offers so an acceleration clause says that you will offer a thousand dollars over any other bona fide received offers up to 160 or for creative agents, 161. And if an offer is 155, that offer with the acceleration clause is now 156 automatically. So it kind of takes some of that bidding out of it and that back and forth. Uh, it, it, it's used by many agents. And I think agents need to talk to their clients, both buyers and sellers, about that scenario before they even get in the situation. Aha, uh -huh. so it sounds like a chess game, you know, strategy here <laughs> and there on both ends, which is It's all very negotiations. <laughs> well, 
So, I mean, I, I guess my other, you know, another question um, that we have here is, you know, when you talk about the market and the low inventory, then we had low, uh, have low interest rates. So, you know, money is pretty cheap right now. And does that, does that um, invite others to start thinking about putting their house on the market, knowing that they'd have a better chance potentially of selling it, being low inventory, low interest rates? I mean, is it kind of the perfect storm for selling your house right now? It can be, except where are you gonna go next? So oh. <laughs> for some sellers, Yes, it's a great time to sell your home, but what are you going to move into? And if you don't have that already picked out, some sellers have put their home on the market and put the contingency contingent on seller's ability to find suitable housing. And for some buyers, they can hold on and maybe wait 60 days for that seller to find it. Other sellers are getting a little frustrated because if you have to sell your house to buy the next one, you may be competing with three or four people who don't. So a good agent is going to have that buyer slash seller talk to the bank about a bridge loan or other financing options so that they know what they're gonna get into when they start looking. So my guess is saying that that you, your industry and the banking, the financial industry works very closely together Absolutely. And we are so lucky in the UP. Uh, my friends downstate have to deal with banks that are huge corporations and you don't know who you're talking to from one moment to the next. And I always like my buyers to be pre-approved with a local lender. And I say it's because I need to have somebody that I can put my hands around their neck and squeeze when it needs to happen. But not only do we have great local lenders, but several of our banks, Range, MBank, all have local underwriters. So oftentimes in the loan process, you get a hiccup at some point and it's in the underwriting. And some VA loans will require a termite inspection. Well, that's great and USAA is a fantastic bank for veterans, but when you're doing a local VA loan, they know that they don't. we don't have termites in the UP. So that's not a cost that you're gonna have to deal with when you're dealing with a local lender. So I really feel we are absolutely ahead of the game because we have so many great local lenders. And that's that's great to know. I mean, you know, again, I think some of this partner perspectives is, you know, understanding the different industries, but again, how we relate to other industries. And I know talking to a lot of our friends in the financial institutions, I mean, their numbers from from um, a mortgage or refinancing perspectives are off the charts. Yep. You know, they, they can't write them fast enough. There's and I've understood that there's, you know, sometimes people closing, you know, a month or two months out just because, you know, of all of the activity. Plus, then you add in the PPP loans, um, you know, from the COVID oh, type. And, you know, they're crazy. Our bankers are working really hard right now. One well, of the things that I found interesting, uh, people trash millennials all the time. And um, when they're our age, I keep saying, you know, we're the ones that raise these millennials, but I'm finding millennials of all ages have a strong desire for home ownership. Single women, single men, they don't, they aren't waiting until we meet and we fall in love and we get married and then we buy a house. It's, I, I want a dog and I need a fenced yard for my dog. And that's what we're seeing from millennials. And a lot of millennials don't understand that you don't have to have 20% down to buy a house. So we can put first time home buyers, we can put any buyer into a new home for sometimes three to 5% down and having the seller contribute towards their closing costs. So for some buyers, it is cheaper to buy a house that has tremendous tax advantages and you are investing in your own future than it is to go into another rental. 
Yeah, I, I I understand that. And that's interesting because, again, um, from an economic development standpoint, a lot of what we've heard over the years is, oh, the, you know, the millennials want to be more flexible and mobile and home buying isn't something that they're going to be considering. So it's good to know that, you know, some of that mindset is maybe not correct uh, as Absolutely. well, you know. And, and I think they are understanding that you can sometimes be more flexible with home ownership than you can with a lease. If you decide you want to move, you maybe can keep your house as a rental and now it's an investment for you. Right. Or you can put it on the market. You don't have to wait. You just renewed your lease and you got a really great job opportunity somewhere else. Then you, you can't do anything with a lease. You can with something you own. Right, that's true. So much to think about. Um, you know, everybody, we all know our own industries and our own professions very well. I, and I find this so interesting just to talk with others because we don't get into the nitty gritty. And if we're not buying or selling a house, we're really not thinking about real estate necessarily. Now, in economic development, we do just because it's an important asset when you're, you know, selling your community, which goes to a, a question we just had. Um, somebody asking, okay, so a lot of times we hear that um, housing is very expensive in Marquette and not so much on the West End, um, that there's no housing, there's a housing shortage. What is kind of your view of the more global look at Marquette County's housing um, industry? I think that oftentimes we get a little locked into our little microcosm and people are saying, no, but I want to live in Marquette when maybe there are better buys in Nagani or Ishpeming or Chocolate. And when you talk to people in other areas and you're like, oh, I just bought a house and I now have a 12 minute commute to work and they just kind of laugh at us. <laughs> uh, here, we have a whole lot of options within the county limits. And I think our job as agents is to help expand people's ideas of what they're going to consider for location. And I think a lot of times people want a certain style of home. You know, they're looking for a traditional four square, two story, and we have those in all of our regions. I think we do have in the city of Marquette, we do have a limitation to our starter houses. And people tend to say, you know, they're anything under 150 is, is crap and needs work. Well, a lot of starter homes are going to need work. And for a lot of people, they're either able to do the work or find people that can help them do the work. So I don't dismiss those out of hand. I think that you have to look at the whole picture and the whole picture includes what are your utilities going to be, what are your taxes going to be, uh, and those things all come into play as well when you're considering where you're going to purchase. And the neat thing for my first time home buyers now that are buying in Nagani and Ishpeming where maybe they would have wanted Marquette, Nagani and Ishpeming have so much going on that it is much more of a community than it was uh, even 10 years ago. And I think that's where we see the intersection of economic development and housing, because as we can, as LSCP, we can help businesses grow, maintain, and expand. It does make for better communities for people when they're looking to buy houses. Yep, that's a good point. Um, so another question that just came in is, um, so rumors have it that, you know, after, you know, we've got post pandemic, well, I don't know if we can call it post yet, but as people uh, in say hotspots across the country or with families that have been dealing with this, start looking at, you know, what, what, where do they want to raise their families for the long haul? We've just proven the fact in the Upper Peninsula that we can work remotely, which has always been something that we're criticized for, but we just spent four months doing it remotely and it can be done. Are you seeing any interest from outside folks, you know, making those decisions now that they can potentially work anywhere for the long run? Absolutely. And one of the fields that we have in our uh, multiple listing service field database is we have hardwired internet. And so a listing agent checks hardwired internet and we can use that as a search. 
because a lot of times people want to come up, they want to live in the UP, but I'm going to telecommute, so I have to have hardwired internet. And a house that I had listed on 480 in Sands Township on 10 acres, just outside, right inside the Sands line, right outside of the Chocolay line, has natural gas and hardwired internet, and it sold in less than a week. And it sold to people that are moving up from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And part of what it sold is because it has that hardwired internet. And I think people are seeing that, yes, that is something they want to search for. And if I'm, I'm also hearing that if I'm ever going to be another pandemic, I don't want to be stuck in fill in the blank. And yep. so we have retirees that are moving up here because it's closer to their kids and they're just not going to have that possibility of being stuck away from people they love for three months again. So yeah, and absolutely yeah, I, we have people yeah, coming in. I think, I think it's important because, I mean, there's been so much of a, of a negative impact um, to the coronavirus and in our economy. But I do think from rural communities or micropolitan communities, you know, like us, we have a real opportunity here as people look to social distancing, working remotely. The next time something hits, I want to be in a safer place with my family or a more comfortable feeling place. So, so that's interesting that you're already starting to see that because I Absolutely. guess I'm not surprised, which is great. I know we're, we're running short on time here, but um, we do have um, one more, I have one more question I'll just um, go for um, as far as the ones that have come in. Um, so how do we compare to other markets? Um, uh, they, people always say, you know, hey, the cost of living is lower here. We should be able to pay lower. And, you know, I, I just haven't found that to be factual when you look at the numbers. But how does our housing market compare to, you know, other areas downstate or you, you work at the national level, you know, in comparable communities um, in, in the Midwest? We, we absolutely tend towards the higher level on house prices. But one of the reasons for that is because when the economy tanked the last time, the Upper Peninsula, Marquette County didn't tank at the same rate. So we didn't have a massive fallback in prices. We just kept going along. And I've often said that the UP kind of rides the waves differently. We don't have the extreme highs, but then we don't get the extreme lows. So yes, they may be a little bit higher, but I think we've proven that you're not going to be making a bad investment because we don't tank. So the fact that we can maintain our values through pandemics and recessions and everything else that we've been able to is one of the things that makes us strong. And I think that comes because we have a community that's not supported by just one industry. And I think yeah. that's something as a community we want to encourage and, and grow that multiple, multifaceted uh, view of what fuels our economy. That's a that's a really really excellent point to end on here, Stephanie. Um, if you do like on Marquette.org, our our website, we do a lot of data, and you always help us with the um, the you know the home sales and the the median home sales pricing, and we have not seen it tank. We we continue to see it grow. So there is data to back that up, and also data in our data booklet that's online um, that can help show that as well. Um, I will also, since I get the microphone um, while I'm, before I do my exit speech here, I just want to also let people know that announced yesterday, as we talk about the the, the economy and working toward recovery and rebound, uh, the MEDC and the, and the legislature just announced uh, new restart grants, uh, similar to the ones that were done in March. The process will be a little different. Uh, that is listed right on our website under the COVID resources. Uh, that grant application uh, opens on on July 15th through August 5th. It's up to $20,000 for small business, 50 employees right. or less. 
So I think that's just really important as we talk about all these positives. This is another positive to help us continue to rebound um, into recovery uh, and move forward. So please, you know, stay in tune to that. You'll be getting a lot more information on, from the partnership on that. But I wanted to point that out because I think that's really critical at this time. Also, our Love on Local gift card program. Uh, we just hit $120,000 in sales um, thanks to the Rock on Local from Eagle Mine uh, and our underwriters. Uh, uh, this has been a, a great testament to our community and how important um, buying local and keeping local, um, you know, keeping their cash registers ringing and keeping them in business has been. So with that, I'm going to thank you, Stephanie. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. I appreciate your work as a board member um, on the committees here. You manage our, our marketing and membership committee. You're an officer. I agree. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Um, and for all of you that listened in on our first partner perspective, uh, thank you. Uh, hope you have a great rest of your day and look forward to continuing to do this with all the different sectors and industries that we have. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you.